I'm going to have to say this really slowly so you guys can think about it. Number one is that we believe and endorse the supernatural 100 times. However, we would take in a heartbeat any natural solution that comes to us because we always think a bird in the hand is better than a hundred on the tree. So although we really like the idea of the supernatural, but when a natural solution is given to us, give me that, give me that. You know, you still can pray, you can still pray. But you know what, I, I, I want that natural. And that's not wrong because by the way, by the way, when you think about those parents who denied their, their kids just simple things as an antibiotic, maybe that's a bit stu stu stupidity. But still, for us, as we think of ourselves as moderate, you would count on a hundred times on a natural solution, on a medical intervention. You would spend all your money to get that medical intervention, right? Because you've got far more trust in it than in the supernatural. But you still believe in the supernatural. The second point, while the occurrence of healing, when healing happens, it is not always attributed to supernatural powers. The lack of healing is always blamed on the supernatural powers. I'm going to say this again. Achievement of healing is not usually attributed to supernatural powers. You got a great drug, you got a great doctor, you got a great hospital, you got the best health system in the world. The lack of healing is usually blamed. <laughs> on lack of intervention from the supernatural powers. I find it very, it's almost like it's very ironic. When you pick up a stick, you pick it from both ends. You can't just pick one side. But yet we always want to have this, we want, we want to dance this dance, okay? You know, when we have good natural resources to heal us, give me that. But when it doesn't fail, fina kerop. So then very quickly, where did this separation come from? And I'm going to take you over a very quick tour over the last 3,000 years of our civilization. Always in the mind and in study, there was three lines that were happening together and you could not separate them. One line was the study of God, that was theology. That's how we think of the supernatural. The second one was the study of nature. How do we think of the nature, including sickness and illness? And the third one, how do you think of man? Because you know what, all these three are intertwined. In the polytheistic world, Nature was a tool for the gods and spirits. They controlled. That's why you got to sacrifice to the gods. That's why if I get sick, maybe I'll change my god and go to a different god because I heard that another god is a little bit more powerful. And man at that time is just nothing but a slave to the supernatural. In the Judeo-Christian faith, no, nature was given as a gift from God to humanity, including nature and including science till this day. Yes, we don't believe that in anymore. It's a gift, but it is a gift given to us. And man is not a slave. He's not a slave to nature and he's not even a slave to God. He's an image. Totally different. This was actually the viewpoint until the medieval A's. Augustine always said, you know what, his four points. Two books of truth, book of scripture, book of nature. Both need interpretation. However, the spiritual fact of life, which means what? Whether I'm healed or not, there's a spiritual truth there. The natural fact may change. Hey, all of us are going to die one day. I might get healed today, I might not get healed tomorrow. The brain cancer might go now, but in five years it might come back. But the spiritual truth behind that will never change. The issue became that the battle between the supernaturalism and naturalism is, is God the primary cause of everything and laws of nature are secondary? Or laws of nature become the primary thing? Which basically you get an organism, you get a bug, you get infected, you treat it by an antibiotic, done deal. Done deal. Why would you even interfere, God? Why would you put God into this? That's the mind of the naturalist. The supernaturalist would say, you know what? God is the primary cause of all of that. Where are we in this? And I think the problem with us is that we're, <laughs> we're in this tough battle between both of them. The problem is that in the 16th and 15th century, as science got better with Galileo Copernicus, you started to find actually something very interesting. That they started, and by the way, these are the people, even now in modern science, they tell you the church was always against science. That is never the truth. Because the people of the church are the ones who discovered most of science. They always looked to study nature as a way to glorify God. They looked at nature that is revealing God's work. So when they studied and they saw that nature had laws, they were so amazed. Why? Because God, the Logos, is rational and made all these amazing laws. So for them, it was never a conflict of interest. But at that time, they started to find out 
you know, the Bacon, Bacon's way, Boyle, Paley, Newton. And all this happened at that time because they started to realize that mechanisms for natural causes are discovered. So when 3,000 years ago they said that God is the one who made the sun appear every morning, well, after Copernicus and Galileo, they said, no, it's just, you know what, this is nature. When they saw that, you know what, a baby is born this way, well, it was like, no, Mendel found, you know, inheritance, found uh, genetic uh, predisposition. I said, no, you know what, I don't think God is there. The mechanism has been discovered. The problem is that the mechanism went very quickly to what's called materialism, that the mechanism became the God that causes. Mechanism was supposed to describe and to explain, but it very quickly became the God. And then you get something very interesting, which is where I believe is our current problem. Out of this, because also that man became more knowledgeable, skepticism, rationalism, all of this theory of mind, you found that people became one of three things. Okay, very simply. A group that still believes in the supernatural as the primary cause of everything. That's one side. The other side is a group that became atheists that thought that materialism, the matter, is the cause and the reason for everything. But then there was a group in the middle which was called the deist. And this is a very dangerous group. You know why? Because I think this is where we're at now. The deists believe that God created everything but then left it alone. It goes by its own natural rules. God set the rules and let the rules take over. God set the world and universe and let the universe A take over. So God started everything, but then after that, hands off. Hands off. So it's called a deist, which means that they believe in a, de a deity. But they do not believe that God intervenes over and over again in the world as it is. He started, but that's it. We could be, unfortunately, some of us in that issue at this point. So this has the battle. Theism, deism, atheism. Nature as God's revelation versus naturalism. Man is God's image versus man became the only certainty. Don't tell me about God. You have an antibiotic, take it. You don't have tough luck, just go and die. It is what it is. Don't invoke God in this. So that became a little bit of the mindset of those centuries. So then where are we at this point? Let's bring it back to 21st century. Because do I believe that miracles still happen? Do I still believe in the supernatural? Where is my line? And I'll tell you my personal story. When I started doing interventional cardiology, it was a beautiful thing that I loved doing. Because you know what? There was nothing that I could feel that would give me this instantaneous gratification. You get a guy who's dying on the table from a heart attack and he's just having crushing chest pain and then with all the modern advances I put in the balloon and I balloon it up and the artery just opens up and the guy say you know what my pain is gone wow wow his heart kind of fibrillates and I take the paddles and I shock him and he starts again wow you know what happened during my first two three years of practicing I became God I became God because I felt you know what I had the tools I'm okay. I felt very skilled. I was very happy with that. I felt very gratified with that. I felt very gratified when I go out, you know, to the patient's family and they say, I was like, you know what? Thank you for saving my husband's life. I would not even think twice about saying, I don't even have to tell them, even in my heart, tell them, it's like, yeah, it's God. For the first couple of years when I was in practice after my fellowship, the supernatural for me was like, you know, I, I'm not, I, I didn't say I denied it. I didn't say I denied it, but I can tell you for sure I ignored it. Until God, and this is one of the most amazing things about God, He talks to us in some weird ways. I had another case which was really freaked me out. So I had another guy, he was in his 50s, came in with also one of these massive heart attacks, cardiac arrest, and he was on the table in the cath lab, um, completely out for almost like a full hour, and doing chest compressions for a full hour. This was like a middle of the night, 3 o'clock in the morning case. And I was doing, uh, putting in the balloon, putting in the stent and trying, and it's like, he's, we're shocking him, and the nurses are doing CPR, and the nurses are getting tired. And after, like, if anyone of you has done CPR, trust me, if you're doing real CPR, if you last more than five, ten minutes, you are a brave soul. It is tiring. So we're like, you know, three o'clock in the morning, we have no staff, 
and they're getting tired. And this one nurse who was doing CPR was just really, I could see him slowing down, and I could see the guy's blood pressure just plummeting, and things just going wrong. And I was like, you know what? Keep it up. Keep it up, Dan. Keep it up. Don't give up. Don't give up. Please, you know, keep going and continue the CPR. So, you know, the guy made it through. And then usually once they're done with this kind of hospitalization and all that, they usually follow up with the nurse practitioner and, and, you know, a lot of different things. And then he came to me after six months. And um, he walks into the clinic room. And I, like, you know, it's just another chart. That's what was one of my problems with medicine. Like, you know, you look at charts like, yeah, so-and-so, heart attack six months ago, lived. Okay, good. Are you on your meds? He's like, you know, are you taking them? So, are you smoking? No. He's like, are you on your exercising? Yes, yes. Checklist. Move on. And uh, the guy, after I'm done with this, is like, okay, we'll see you back in another six months. He tells me, Doc, I want to ask you a question. He's like, yeah, go ahead. As we're shaking hands, like, on the way out, it's like walking him out. <laughs> Um, I was like, I want to ask you a question. I was like, yeah, okay, go ahead. Why during the case you kept telling people, don't give up? Don't give up. And I was like, what? What do you mean? Where, where do you know this from? I was like, I don't know, but I have a vivid memory that at the time of this case, as a patient, I have this vivid memory, I cannot explain it. But I believe at that time that my soul, I was witnessed the whole thing that was happening at that time in the cath lab. And I was looking at this body on there and I was not able to identify with this body, but I was seeing a scene of people who were so frantic. And you're in the middle there, just keep saying, don't give up, don't give up, keep going. This guy has a family, this guy has kids. And I said, you saw that? Really? I was like, yeah. I've had this memory and I cannot erase it. I, I freaked out. Because as we all know, and you guys must have read the, all, a lot of the books about like, the near-death experience, that was my first time to encounter a patient who actually explained to me that involved me. And I kind of like said something very interesting, like, well, you know what, if this guy is up there watching, who else is watching? <laughs> you know, it's like, if he's watching, Yanni, Yanni, I bet you there's a lot more people who are watching. And that really struck me at that time as like, who am I to deny that this line between natural and supernatural, I am pushing it completely away. I'm ignoring it. Because just I feel that I'm so competent and so confident and so privileged to have all these tools in my hand. When God created Adam, I want you to contrast now these two images in your mind. Because at the end of the day, what we have in our hand is a tool. We make out of it what we decide. On one side, when God created Adam in Genesis 1 and 2, he said, be fruitful and increase in number. Be the best scientist you can. Be the best surgeon you can. Be the best dentist you can. Be the best physical therapist you can. You want to get those patients in quadriplegia to walk again? Good for you. I want you to go after it. That was the meaning of increase and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it. You know what the word subdue means? Have dominion, not the other way around. The reality is that what we're doing right now in our modern medicine and our modern ways is that we are being subdued by it. They have dominion over us. And then when he had the animals, he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. That's an amazing sentence, by the way. Because is God incapable of naming these animals? <laughs> you know, he created them. Believe it or not, this is the first mention of science in the Bible. You know why? Because taxonomy... Okay? Classification is what? Is naming. And it's amazing the power that the Bible gives to Adam at that time. Whatever they named it, you're Mrs. Turtle. You're the hippopotamus. Whatever they named it. And if any one of you has studied biblical studies, they know that naming is a dominion, a superior names. So God gave us the power over science. God gave us the power over nature. God gave us the power to subdue, to fruit, to be fruitful, multiply, and bless. Now contrast this with another one. In the Tower of Babel, look at these people. When they, what happened at that time? They said, you know what, I'm not too happy with this. We would like to make a name for us. The word name really is very interesting in these contexts. I'm not happy with the name that God gave me. Because here it is. You remember the naming comes from top to bottom. So God named Adam and Eve, right? 
And he left Adam and Eve to name nature. Now I, in the middle, as an agent of God, I didn't like that. And I said, you know what? I'm going to make a name for myself. And when I'm going to make this name, I'm going to make sure actually to go up all the way up to heaven because I'm going to butt head with God. <laughs> Simple as that. I want, you know, I don't like your name. I'm going to make my name. But then what the, the interesting thing is what God said about the people of Babel at that time. Nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. 21st century. 21st century. Nothing that they plan to do would be impossible for them. You want to create a new organ to transplant? It's happening. You want to even potentially, I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but make a living creature? God only knows. But he may have said from the beginning, maybe that's the end of the world at that time, because God is going to say, you know what? Just like I wiped with Noah, and that's actually what St. Peter says in his epistle. When St. Peter refers to the judgment day when humanity's butt-heading with God reaches an extreme, he refers back to what? To the flood. So as Christ healed and Christ raised people from the death, he gave his disciples. But it's interesting when the disciples, because you know what, when, when Peter said to him, you know what, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but whatever I have, I'll give you. When you go and heal the patient with your medication, with your dental equipment, with your, 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 um, your skills as a physical therapist, are you telling them this is the skill, hey, I paid a lot of student loans to get this, you got to understand this. Or do you tell them, you know what, whatever I have, I give to you. In fact, and that was kind of a point that actually as Christ raised from the death, Peter and Paul did raise from the death. So did I have the power to raise my patient who was a flat brain line from the death? Maybe. But I don't think that was the sign meant for me. But the whole point is that our power over nature, as Christ had that power, as the disciples had that power.